everyone. Thanks again for downloading this new episode of the Satisfied God Podcast. Really appreciate that. As promised, this one, uh, this this episode is being uploaded a week departed from the last episode uh, instead of two weeks as as we normally do, just to make up for the delay at the first of the year. So. I hope this is okay, and I appreciate you guys, uh, again, downloading and listening. Today, this episode is going to take us basically right from where we left off in our last time together, and that's in the first verses of Romans chapter 7. We'll still touch on some of the uh, verses we dealt with in in the first verses in our last episode, but then we get into... <clears throat> a couple of other areas, and we focus specifically, uh, or not specifically, but we focus very much on the thought of you are not in the flesh. Paul says that. When you were in the flesh, Paul says in these verses in Romans 7 and Romans 8, he goes on and elaborates on that and says, but you are not. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. That is a tremendous statement that has been missed, overlooked, or just totally missed uh, in the church world today because that still is posed as a great deal of a question uh, in the heart of most people and is presented as a question in the church. Are you in the flesh? Or are you in the spirit? And we seem to present that as some kind of a, um, as something that can be determined by looking at outward deeds, actions, uh, dispositions, demeanor. But it's not. Paul makes it very plain that the that the state of being that he is describing there of being in the spirit and no longer in the flesh has nothing to do with your performance, good or bad. It has to do with one thing, one thing, a divine work of God that has been wrought by birth, new birth, and that is if the spirit of Christ dwells in you. That's the only condition that has to be met for the state of being in the spirit and not in the flesh to be a reality. I hope we focus on that. I hope we consider that at least during this time and in the days and weeks ahead. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. That has a a lot to do with that statement. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. So that's what we look at during this uh, time together, and I'm not going to take any more time to uh, to delay us getting into it. Hope you enjoy it. I'll be back at the end. Okay, um, I think the last time we were starting uh, Romans seven, right? I think and. Dealing with Paul's example in Romans 7 about the woman married to the first husband and then the first husband dying and she is free from the law of her husband. And we, we dealt with that differentiating between the what, what law was he talking about there are People get it confused. I think people think that he's throughout that whole thing talking about the law of Moses, and he's not. Um, There are certain areas where he is, but most of it he's talking about the law that is embodied or personified in that first man, that first husband. And that's the law that Paul's going to talk about or describe in Romans 7 by giving his own personal Uh, example of being a man under the law of Moses yet governed by the law that is contrary to the 
to the righteousness testified of in the law of Moses, if that makes sense. And so, basically, he's describing in Rome, he's he's taking on his argument from from Romans chapter six on in to seven, and using now an example of showing a transition that God has brought about. The same transitions, the same translation from one to the other, from dead in sin to dead to sin, from. Uh, uh, you know, becoming free from sin that we may become the slaves of righteousness. He's he's saying those same things now, but just in another example that the people would understand, and especially those he will say here that know the law. And um, I'm going to start in verse th- uh, 3. We're going to go into probably 4 and 5 and 6 tonight a little more. But I'm going to read starting in verse uh, 3 of Romans 7. So if so, then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, now he's bringing that example into its summary. Now he's applying it and showing them what he's meaning. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So again, he's continuing this this example or continuing this contrast. He says the same thing in chapter 6, but now he's just using a, a natural example to say the same thing. Basically, that they have been brought from death unto life, that they are now dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God, and now that becomes something that must be reckoned in their heart recognized the recognition of the translation out from one into the other must become the experience and enjoyment of the heart it's it's a done deal it's a transaction that has been wrought of god yet it is a transaction that must be revealed of god and made known for the soul to truly enjoy the freedom from the first husband and the and the marriage that has been brought about in the spirit with the soul and the new man, another man. But if her husband be dead, that's a phrase I was looking at here a few days ago. These two phrases, if her husband be dead. See, that that's something we can consider for a long time, right? Because it seems like in the church world, that's still a question. That's that's a question. Paul's not meaning it really for us. Now, he'll say it that way, but for us, he's not talking about this as a question or some kind of a, a, a progressive state of saying uh, maybe he is, maybe he's not. I remember when I first came into this gospel, when I began to listen and hear it and, and uh, fellowship with people that were in it, that was the big question. And it was still a question. These were born-again people filled with the Spirit. And yet the whole question was, is the old man dead yet? Is he dead? And then they would get into debate of how do we know he's dead? And how can we kill him if he's not dead enough? (laughs) That you know, it becomes a religious um, 
a work of the flesh, basically, trying to perform, produce, or bring about some end that we are yet sure that has been brought about. Is the man dead or not? Well, Paul is not posing these things as questions. If you read, again, this is a continuation of chapter 6. You read in chapter 6, verse 6 and 7 says, This knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin, that's the whole body of that man of sin, may be destroyed in King James, made useless in the Young's literal, for our no longer serving the sin. For he who hath died hath been set free from the sin. There is the freedom. She is made free from the law of her husband. It is not a question, and we're still combating that question. We're still asking it, seemingly. Is that old man dead yet? Why can we ask that? Because we're not seeing the clean-cut transition that Paul is seeing. We are still assessing self and looking at that question based upon what we see looking at ourselves. Because you see good, and you see bad, and you see you know more bad than good, and then you say, oh, man, he must not be dead yet. But see, that determination is not left up to you to make based upon an outward observation. That determination and that reality has been made. That has been a settled issue from the time of the cross. And when you are born again, you are not born again with the promise that the old man will be dead. You are brought into a new man, thus the old man is no longer in the picture. That's a clean cut. That's the transaction of salvation. There are no limbos, no no state of limbo that we're brought into. There's no purgatory here. It is a state of absolute righteousness. Why? Because the man who's now in you is made unto you righteous. And he's not continually having to shove the other man out. If he dwells in the house, no other can. And the whole basis of religion is based upon that yet not yet uh, halfway done salvation concept. Where yes, he's in me, but yes, this other man is too. And there's this constant struggle between the two. None of that exists in reality. It only exists when our soul is not aware of the newness of life that has come. But in in matter of fact, and according to our true state of being, the old man is dead and our soul has been united to another. And where that other, the new man is, nothing of the first man can be. Nothing. And you, I mean, we can all look at those things, hear that, and say, yeah, yeah, but. There's a lot of buts we can bring into that when we're assessing things based upon the outward. But as far as God's perspective and God's knowledge of these things, of his ultimate intention and his finished work, One man remains. And if we are born again, we are joined to or married to that man. The man of righteousness, the man of perfection, the man of life. And he has made unto us all spiritual fullness. So this is not a question for us. The old man is crucified with him. And there's other places, many other places where he says the same thing. Matter-of-factly stating this clean cut, this sanctification, if you will, that has taken place because he has made unto us sanctification. Paul is describing a translation out from one man into another man that has already taken place and has been realized of God in those who are in Christ. 
Unfortunately, that's not the understanding of most believers. But it is the gospel nonetheless. The declaration of the gospel is a matter of perfect truth. It is not left up to or um, dependent upon happenings, events, situations, circumstances, what I do, what I do not do. That, that changes nothing. We're talking about the seed of God. Remember how we started all these classes. One man, one seed determines all things. And you cannot qualify that statement. That is a reality based upon birth, where one man by natural birth determined everything with regard to your soul's state of being and relation to God, so the new, the seed of God, the seed that is incorruptible, being born of that seed determines now all things with regard to the soul that is born of that seed. All that that seed is, all that that person, that man, that that life that is now present, all that he is has determined all things. So what what about us now? What what is the what is the occupation now that we must be about? What is the pursuit that we must be after? Religion would say you go and do, and you try to make it so. The Spirit of God says, come and see. We have been given the Spirit of God that we may know the things that have been freely given, the gift of grace that has been given to us in Christ, as Christ, that we may know reality as it truly and presently is. So, These verses is Paul's attempt to demonstrate the futility of looking to the law because he's, again, going to give his own experience under the law because he's talking to people who, just like the Galatians, just like the Colossians, many of them are being swayed to look to the law to try to find righteousness. That's why in Romans 3, he very plainly says, guys, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, all are under sin. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's going to demonstrate in this example in Romans 7. You're all under the authority and the government of the husband to which you are married, whether you are a Jew or Gentile. If your soul is married to the first man, You are under the government and under subjection to that man. That man determines all things. It doesn't matter if you are under a law that testifies of a perfect righteousness because of the uh, the seed that's in you, because of the man to which your soul is married. You can never obtain to the righteousness that law testifies of. Why? Because that law is testifying of another man. And the only way for that righteousness to become a reality is your soul to be married to that man. Because that man is the righteousness you have attempted to, under subjection to the wrong man, you've attempted to obtain. See what I'm saying? And that's what... That's what Paul is going to demonstrate. And that's why it's such a fallacy to read Romans 7 like it is a believer having some type of meltdown where it's a believer missing the mark, being good, doing good things and still having trouble and then falling. And that's not what it's about. To read Romans 7 like it's a struggle of a believer, a struggle of one who is born of the incorruptible seed is to totally miss the reality he is describing there. Because he's showing you that it doesn't matter, that what matters, the thing that truly determines everything, is who is in you. What life is there? Is there life there? If the life of which the law testified of, but could of which the law testified but could not provide is in you, then righteousness is real in you. 
and is fulfilled in you, just like you'll say in Romans 8. If not, righteousness will never be obtained because who you are by nature, who your soul is married to by first birth, has determined your state, and that is sin and death, and you cannot get out of that except the death of Christ. Well, how does that happen? And so religion will give you all these long, drawn-out processes to go through to make that so. There's only one process, and he's already talked about it in Romans 6. We who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. That's being born again. Being baptized into his death, circumcised with his circumcision. That's all a work of new birth. That's a work of Christ coming to dwell in your soul and bringing about in the soul the transition that no religious activity could ever bring about. Perfect obedience to the law could not sever your soul from that first man. Nothing could except union to another. Because that man brings an end to the first. And there is no limbo between the two. The one is the immediate transaction of the other. Being found in Christ means no longer found in the first. Being in Christ means you're not in Adam. Being in life now means you're no longer in death. You have come from death unto life. There's no limbo there. There's no gray area there. That's a once and for all absolute and a sudden work of God that takes place the moment the new man comes to live in you. This is what he's describing here. It's Paul again saying, guys, the law is not going to help you. The law doesn't make you any more righteous than any other external activity toward God. And we're going to show you an example here in a second. Uh, Let me read this first, and we'll go to an example that really demonstrates something that most of us, most people don't look at. Uh, Paul is demonstrating the futility of looking to the law for the furtherance or the acquisition of any true spiritual condition, a relationship with God. Paul is not demonstrating merely the sad condition of Jews only who have rejected the Messiah. He sees all mankind in the same condition. See, he's not saying that's the Jew's problem because the Jew can't live by the law. No, he's saying, he's going to show you again in this example. He can try his best and be perfect at adhering to the law and still never obtain the righteousness it demands. Because perfect adherence could not overcome the state of being could not sever you from the marriage that you were in or the bondage to a man that you were under. All mankind are in the same condition. Read Romans 3 again. Whether they are Jew in the flesh or Gentile in the flesh because natural birth has ushered mankind into a condition of sin and death. Nothing he did did it, just being born. He was a sinner. Remember we read it in Romans 5? He was a sinner because he was born. Now, man is constitutionally contrary to the law of God. Everything he is. Now, you cannot, he, again, that's why he's not saying it's, it's, it's people under the law. It's just people under the law because he's seeing that Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. They can be under the righteous commandments of the law of Moses 
or they can worship idols. And they are still governed by the same law because their soul is married to the same man. They're still under government, under the governance of the first man, the first husband. And here's an example of that, and he says this in Galatians chapter 4. Starting in verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem them. This brings you to Christ made unto us redemption. How did he redeem them? He would live in them and be unto them the righteousness they could never obtain. And the inheritance they were intended for, but was not theirs apart from him. That's why it says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And you can receive nothing. So that he might redeem them under the law. Now he's talking to Jews. That he might, that they might, that we, now he brings us and the Jew into it all we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, verse, verse uh, 6 here, the, the way the King James and some other translations say it, I, I, I've always hated the translation because it seems backwards. It seems like because you're sons, he sent the spirit of his son. And that's like saying, you know, you had to get to be a son before the son himself could come to be in you. Now, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. If you look it up, it means the seal, the son, the sealing of your sonship is this. That they might receive the adoption of sons. And here is the seal of that sonship. Here's what makes this sonship so. God has sent the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Bringing a soul into relationship it had no hope of otherwise. Whether that is a Jew soul or a Gentile soul, that son is what brings about such a relationship. Therefore, again, re writing to the Galatians, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. However, at that time, when you did not know God, that means you were not in Christ, you were not born again. He's talking to Gentiles now. He's already addressed Jews that he came to redeem them that were under the law. He's already said the seal of our sonship, whether Jew or Gentile, is that the sons in us, showing them that salvation has come in Christ and showing them they're no longer slaves, but they are sons. How be it? When you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. What did they serve? Idols. They were idol worshipers. They, they were heathen. They, they worshipped gods. They worshipped idols and different things. They didn't worship the God of, of Moses. They didn't do that. They worshipped idols and all kinds of different things. So what is he doing here? When you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, and then he backs up and says, rather are known of God, securing their soul, not in their knowing of God, but in God's knowing of them. Bringing it upon its true and firm basis. Now that you have come to know, or rather are known of God, how is it that you turn again to weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days, months, seasons, years. Because why? They're try they are being swayed to go into the law to find righteousness. And what he's doing here, guys, is saying, listen, you can be under the law of Moses or worship idols. And it's all the same thing. There's no difference. There's no difference at all. The law cannot provide you, if you go to the law, the law, those elemental things, days and months and seasons and years, go into Colossians chapter 2, he tells you the same thing. The law cannot provide you any greater salvation, liberty, or deliverance than those false idols that you served 
as heathen. You know what that's saying? It doesn't matter, guys. The whole issue is not the form of your religious observation. The issue is do you have the spirit of the Son in you crying, Abba, Father, or not? That's the issue. The issue is he living in you or not. That's the issue. That's the only issue that Paul is addressing here. This translation, out from the one into the other, wasn't out from Gentilism into Judaism. It was out from the first man into another man. That's the translation that he's addressing here. Now, the issue is being born again or not. Paul is continuing again his thought from Romans 6 concerning this translation from one to the other. Where the soul is dead to sin and alive unto God in Christ. Remember we said it. If you are now servants of sin, you are free from righteousness. But now being free from sin, that's the same as being freed from the law of her husband. If you're free from sin, you are now the slaves of righteousness. And we dealt with that, the liberty of our soul's enslavement. There's a true liberty to this bondage we've been brought to in Christ. Bound to another man, bound to another husband, and thus bound to another law. Bound to the law of this new husband, which Paul will talk about in Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ that frees us from the law of sin and death. That's the same as saying free from the first husband and the law of that husband. And this does not happen, again, guys, this doesn't happen when you see the second man. It happens when your soul becomes indwelt by the second man. Then there is the seeing of that man that must take place for the soul to enjoy the true liberty that has been wrought of God, the true deliverance that has come, but the deliverance nonetheless has come because that new man is now residing in the heart. Paul is not talking about some process of elimination or a continual ridding of self, ridding ourselves of the first. So we look at us and we say, man, I'm not rid of the first man yet. There's not enough of the second man in me. And that's the whole game, isn't it? That's the whole game we play. You are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Dead to the law because you're dead to the man that was the embodiment of that law. Why? Because you're found in another man. That's what happened. You're not dead to the law because you did something to become dead to him except be found in another. Be married to another. That's that's what happened. So what now? Relationship with your husband. That's what now. When we are married in real life, we don't continually try to get married. We hopefully are knowing the one to which we have been married. We are in fellowship, relationship with our husband or wife. Now fellowship, now relationship, now knowing. But that's based upon what? A covenant relationship that is absolute and certain. Not two men living in the same house and we've got to decide which one we're kicking out. See, that's how ridiculous we make it in religion. God didn't leave such up to us and he didn't leave such up to whatever. He took care of that. He took care of that. Here's some verses that uh, basically say that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. We've read this one before in these classes. or Both of them actually, but. In whom you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. 
in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. What body? The body of the first husband. It's not just bad things you did in your body. That's an entire man. That's an entire body of sin. How was that put off by the circumcision of Christ? Buried with him in baptism into death. As Paul would say, who severed me from my mother's womb. That's circumcision. Severed means to be cut off from one thing, but more specifically it means to be brought within specific boundaries. Brought into the boundaries that God intended you to be brought into. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. And what happened because you are now quickened together with him? What has happened now that you are in union with this man? He has forgiven you all trespass. See, we think that forgiveness happens to the other man. God just forgives him. No, forgiveness happens when there's no sin. True forgiveness is when there's no cause of offense left. It's the putting away of the cause of offense. That's the forgiveness of sin. In whom we have received forgiveness of sins, he says in Ephesians as well. Blotting out, how, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us. Took it out of the way, nailing it to, it to the cross. What did he nail to the cross? Not the law. He nailed the man of sin and death, the one who was the law of sin and death to the cross, because that was what the law of Moses was contrary to. That was the man contrary to everything God desired, demanded, and required. Because the requirement of God was another man. And as long as your soul was married to the first man, nothing God required could ever be realized. No matter how well you did it. No matter how perfectly you adhered to the letter. No, see, that's what Paul is saying here. Now we serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of letter. The oldness of the letter is looking at the words and trying to imitate what the words say. Yet there's a law in us that is contrary to every word that we read. And even though we do what the words say on the paper, we can never be the one of whom those words testify. So it's an imitation at best and a perversion at worst. But if you are born of the seed of the perfect man, of the new man, if your soul has been united to the second man, then righteousness is a realized reality. It is performed of God in you. That's Romans 8. He's going to go and say that. Now, here's another. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if Christ be not risen. This is verse 14. If Christ be not risen. Now, I... Um, See in verse 4 of Romans 7, just keep that in mind. Romans, Romans 7, verse 4, he says, You are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is what? Raised from the dead. So that we should bring fruit forth fruit unto God. And the church has perverted that thought too. The fruit unto God has everything to do with married to another man, him who is raised from the dead. Why? Because him being raised from the dead, the corn of wheat that fell into the ground and died, and guess what? He brought forth what? Much fruit. 
He brought forth the fruitful branch that glorified the Father, as he says in, in John. He, he brought that forth. He is Aaron's rod that brought forth and that now was returned to the holiest of all so that God could gaze upon him and see in him the whole and know in that fruitful one the whole of Israel. There's the fruit. It's not something we do. It's who he is. Again, read the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. One's you, one's the first man, one's Christ. It's not one with potential to be like the other. It's one or the other. If he be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because... We have testified of God that he has raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. Now see, that's, that's a mouthful right there. Because his being raised is the only raising of the dead. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if Christ, verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you're what? Yet in your sin. You're still married to this man. Because there's no way out of the first marriage unless the second man, another man, the perfect man be raised. See, the cross that we talk about a lot Unfortunately, we talk about it a lot as if the only side of the cross was merely the elimination of the first husband so we could be severed from or liberated from the nature and state that that union brought about. We forget the cross is also the raising up of an incorruptible and perfect man of spirit. So that we may be married to that man. It seems that we like to preach the cross as just the death of the first. And, that, and guess what? We're always looking for that to happen, aren't we? Why? Because we're still looking at that man and still looking at ourselves. I hope that happens soon, right? Oh, boy. Hope that man's dead soon. Well, if he's not, then the cross was in vain. And if he's not dead, then we're saying that the resurrection is not valid. We rarely carry the cross through to the soul being married to the man of spirit. The man who is the perfect husband. There's no state of limbo, as I've said, between these two aspects of the cross if we're actually partakers of the cross. And that means actually born again. Because that's when you become a partaker of the cross. It's not a long drawn out process. It's a once for all reality that comes into the soul the moment it is born again. And makes the soul dead to one and alive unto the other. Brings the soul from death unto life. From flesh unto spirit. That's why, again, we are free. Remember we talked about being free from one thing, become servants to another? The enslavement is that. It's not free from this just to be free from this. It's free from the union of the first unto a covenantal relation to another. And that's why he can say in verse 5 this very thing. And I love the way this is said. And this is missed in the church so much. And it's perverted in the church. These are words used in the church and it's perverted. Because we take it out of this context. We don't use it this way. Paul says here, Romans 7 verse 5. For when we were in the flesh. The motions of sin which were by the law. See, we don't even like to go there, do we? We just think the motions of sin is whatever. 
He says the motions of sin that were by the law worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Meaning the law exposed who you really are. The law didn't make you that. The law exposed who you were. The motions of sin exposed by the law. These are manifest, he'll say in Galatians 5. Adultery, fornication, doesn't mean you do it. It means the man to whom your soul is married, if you're not born again, that's who he is. And he determines that state. You don't have to do any of those things to be indwelt by all of those things and your soul in governed by that very nature, that very law. Everything contrary to the perfect man. So again, Paul being perfectly obedient to the law of Moses meant Nothing. Evil was still there. Even though the the outline that he was playing in, the picture that he was trying to imitate was of a perfect man. Perfection was out of his reach because it was not of his kind. When you were in the flesh. Do you hear that word? You hear that phrase? When you were. That's a past tense. When you were in the flesh. Do you ever you ever hear in the church, boy, you were in the flesh. Man, you were just in the flesh. And so we always examine ourselves whether we were in the flesh. He didn't say that. He said examine yourself whether you be in the faith or not. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. He says in Romans 8, does he not? When you were in the flesh, the motions of sin by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit uh, fruit unto death. Paul is going to talk about that later in these very verses, in this chapter. And was he out in the juke joint or out trying to do bad things? No, he was trying to do the perfect thing, yet... Void of the perfection that he was trying to perform. Void of that life. Void of the presence of the perfect man that that was a testimony of. Wretched man I am. See, he he knew that it wasn't just wretched things he did because he wasn't doing wretched things. But he was a wretched man. Because no matter how perfectly obedient that man could ever be, he was still the wretched man up against the perfect man. The only thing that can deliver his soul from this wretchedness, this contradiction to all that is holy, was the presence of another life. The law of the spirit of life. A life that cannot be condemned. Because no law can bring accusation against it. The law of Moses cannot cannot expose it as contrary to its testimony because that life was the very source of its testimony. So we love to take this statement in the flesh, in the flesh, and we like to make it relative. We look at the situations and the activities and we judge. According to the flesh, whether people are in the flesh or not. (laughs) It's it's the same thing as Paul saying, listen, the, the circumcision in the flesh, judge you who are the uncircumcision in the flesh. How what is he saying that for? Because they're both in the flesh. They're both still related to the first. Therefore, there is nothing of value, nothing of gain to them. That's why I'll say neither circumcision nor uncircumcision doesn't matter, but a new creation. Because circumcision and uncircumcision are still bound by the law of the first. You may find great room to rejoice in it, but it's still evil because it's not him. 
as long as it's something that is bound to the first, to the natural, to the earthly, to the to to you, it is not perfect. It is not spirit, and there is no good thing in it. And see, that doesn't condemn Christians that say, "Oh, what have I got to do to be better?" No, it's saying the better one's already in you. Thank God for the gift of grace. (laughs) The good things now present. Where the first union to the first man made it impossible for any good thing to ever be present or ever be produced. New birth makes it possible. Not only makes it possible, but brings it into realization. Makes it so. Paul is not looking at people and saying, you're in the flesh or not. He's saying, if you're in Christ, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. That's Romans 8, verses 8 and 9. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot what? Please God. That's Romans 7 being exposed again. That man could never please God. He he tried hard, but he can't. Because there's a law that governs that man that is contrary to the true law of God, which is perfect and righteous. But you, he says in verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. What makes that so, Paul? What do I have to do for that to be so? If so, be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Wow, that's quite a that's quite a qualifier, isn't it? If you are indwelt by him, then you are in him and not in the other. Wow, what a perfect salvation. No room for fault, no room for nothing. No no play wiggle room, just a done deal. You're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit because he's in you. And now if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See, this should take the wind out of the sails of those who desire to be the determining object and the center of all things regarding to God's relationship with us. And it should clarify For us, the one who is the subject of God's eternal perspective. It's the one in you that determines it all. One man is of the earth, one man is flesh, and the new man is the Lord from heaven, the man of spirit, the incorruptible, the immortal, the perfect. We determine nothing here. The man who is in us determines all things. The man to whom the soul is married determines all things. And if any man, this again, what he says, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And that's beautiful. If Christ, the man of spirit, is not in you, you don't have a relationship at all with spirit. No amount of activity you do can provide you that. What provides you that? Him. The Spirit of Christ in you. The Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of adoption in you, crying, Abba, Father. Nothing else can provide you with that. And guess what? Nothing contrary, nothing otherwise can counter the absoluteness of that. The absoluteness of such a state due to him being present. The son is in you, you have life, John will say. If he's not in you, you have no life. Man, that's a that's that's so cut and dry, it's hard to mess up, isn't it? You would think. Paul is clarifying the state of the soul. 
He's saying you were now dead to the man and to the law of that man, and you have been married to another. Now affectionately, he would say, pursue the ongoing, revealed, inward acknowledgement of this new husband, this new life, and all that this great gift of God has bestowed. Do not look for more means and methods of bodily exercise. Remember Timothy? He says to Timothy, bodily exercise profits little, profits nothing. Not talking about lifting weights or going to the gym. He's talking about the bodily exercises under the law. They profit nothing. Don't look for those things to produce and achieve what God has already made Christ to be unto you. What is already realized because your soul is married to another. See, we're dealing with a state of being in Christ. It does not leave us with further need to be crucified or to be consumed or to be put away. It doesn't leave us with further aspects of spiritual life to achieve or produce on our part or any further bestowal on God's part that is necessary. God's knowing, God's perspective regarding the salvation of our soul does not have a not yet attached to it. It doesn't have a maybe one day attached to it. It is the I am. There's an inward acknowledgement and a recognition that God gives of this absolute and secured reality that is necessary so that the Soul can actually enjoy and live in obedience and subjection to the divine enslavement that God has brought it into. A divine joining that no man can put asunder. A marriage that we have come to because the man, the perfect man, is now in us. So we're not talking about getting rid of and putting away and casting out. <laughs> we're talking about knowing a perfect state, a perfect union, a perfect salvation God has wrought, bestowed, and desires to reveal. The salvation the prophets looked unto, testified of, that is now Christ in you. We begin in a state of deliverance. We begin as those who have been made free from the law of sin and death. Because we begin... Our beginning in Christ is those who are joined to and married to the perfect man. You don't come to that. You don't achieve that. That is the gift of God. Not of yourselves, lest you should boast. It is the gift of God. So, we'll stop there uh, tonight, guys. All right. Well, I hope that was a blessing to you guys. I, I, I trust it was. And I hope it kind of at least solidified in your heart what Paul is saying, at least scripturally. I know this is a work of God that must take place for us to actually know it, experience it, enjoy the benefits and the beauty of it. But I hope at least scripturally you understand where, where Paul is coming from. We're talking about a state of being that is secure because the state of being is not determined by any other than Christ himself, the Christ that dwells in your soul and is made unto your soul all that he is. And this is the thing that I have seen more clearly and with more impact 
in these chapters of Romans than I've ever seen before. God is dealing with a secure state. God deals with your soul, my soul, as born again believers, let's say that. Uh, those who are born of the Spirit, those who are born of the seed of Christ. He deals with us upon one premise, one basis, and that is the absoluteness of the presence of his beloved Son. And he deals with our soul on that basis alone. He doesn't deal with us in the fragileness of our concepts or the futility of our performances. He deals with us upon the basis of eternal truth. And truth is Christ himself. He stands in the presence of God for us. <clears throat> confirming, settling the matter. Confirming the state of the soul in which he lives. Establishing a fellowship with God, a relationship with God that is exclusively His in the soul that He inhabits. And from that moment on, the Spirit of God is saying, Come and know, come and see. L live with your heart in ever, in an ever ongoing pursuit of the knowing and experiencing of this great gift of grace that is Christ in you it's not a work that yet has to be done it is a finished work that is yet being revealed but the absoluteness of it remains whether we ever see, know enjoy it or not if he's in you he is in you May we, may the Father, may God open our eyes to see. May God show us this great salvation. I appreciate you listening. And it's my heart's desire for you and for me that the souls that we are that is indwelt by absolute, perfect righteousness, absolute, perfect holiness, absolute, perfect sanctification would be unveiled to see and behold the beauty of the Lord. Thanks again for listening. Amen.